Say it again. Hi, I'm Pat Dennis, and welcome to TV Bookshelf. Today I'm thrilled. I'm interviewing a very favorite person, a favorite author of mine, Mary Monica Pulver. That's right. And I'm hesitating with Mary Monica Pulver because actually you have a lot of names, and yes. that is the one that I am most familiar with, but a lot of your readers are familiar with the other names you write under, and yes. they are? Uh, Monica Ferris, and I used to be half of Margaret Fraser, and I have also, uh, with my husband, written as Alan Mary Kufeld. And uh, let's see, I was Margaret of Shaftesbury in the Society for Creative Anachronism. I think that's all. Wow, it's more names than America's Most Wanted, a person on that I've show. I've always said that they'd see all those aliases, you know. You <laughs> People would assume I'm guilty of some crime. But Mary Monica Pulver wrote a now murder this, door. which is a great book. Thank you. It is. This is the uh, a new edition of a book that, that came out from St. Martin's Press in oh, 87, I think, 1987. So it's been rewritten and it's, look, it's done by a, a local small press, FTL Publications. Mm -hmm. uh, I love the cover. They did a really, is really it, good job on the cover. I love this the cover. really nice. And it's uh, a strange sort of story. It's about a group of uh, recreationists, hobbyists, they're also sometimes called. They, uh, they recreate the medieval period. It's like the Civil War, people only mm -hmm. this is medieval. And every year in eastern Pennsylvania, they take over a campground and we have a war. And now you're a member mm -hmm. of this group? I used to be. I'm not active in it anymore. And what is the name? The name of, the I know the name of the group. The group, the group, is, the group is, is the Society for Creative Anachronism. Wow. It started in Berkeley about, boy, it must be close to 40 years ago now. Long, long time ago. And they, um, um, they're they just an interesting, strange bunch of people. And what and, better to write about? Well, yeah, I, I, they have unchoreographed fighting in real armor with wooden swords. And I used to go to the war all the time. It's a great time. And then we were sitting around a campfire one night, and we were talking about a man who used to loan his armor to his squire. And the squire won a couple of tournaments because people didn't know who it was inside the armor. They assumed it was this knight who was a very famous fighter. And I thought, you know, you could get away with murder doing that. Uh -huh. And I said, geez, I want you to write a book. And someone else said, well, why don't you then? And so I did. And so that's the book. That was my first published novel. Well, that's fun. It was fun. It was great fun. It was fun writing it. It was fun talking to the people and, and interviewing them. And, and I put some people that I knew at the war in the book. And it was, it was, it was interesting. And I think a lot of people that are authors are role players at their typewriter or the word processor. Yes. They love to play the roles of their characters. But you were actually able to play it. For real? The word, for yes, real. I, was, I was Margaret of Shaftesbury, abbess of Dear Abbey. <laughs> <laughs> and I had a little bear I carried around with me. He was Father Hugh of Paddington. He was a mass <laughs> priest at the Abbey. I wrote some mysteries about him that got published in Alfred Hitchcock's Mystery Magazine. Oh, great. Yeah, it was fun. It was, it was an interesting thing. I, uh, I thought when I started writing, I was going to write historicals. Mm -hmm. And that was one of the reasons that I got into the SCAs, because I was interested in medieval history. But as it turned out, the, the novel was a mystery, and it turned out that that's all I can write that I can sell. I can write other kinds of books, but I can't sell them. Mysteries are popular. And you've done huge, so well, huge. so well with your mysteries. Now, your very popular series that's out right now is your Betsy Devonshire series. Yes, that's, that's these. These are, um, there are six of them out, with the seventh coming out in January. Um, they're about, a, uh, they're set in Excelsior. Um, this is... I was so flattered about this. You know, actually, I have to say, though, Murder at the War, there are a lot of medieval parts of Excelsior. That <laughs> oh, so no, no there is not. Excelsior is an old-fashioned town, but not that oh, old-fashioned. <laughs> <laughs> There's a weird story about a ghost of a Spaniard. I'll tell you about some Oh, great. Out there. I was collecting ghost stories for one of these books. Um, it's about a, a woman who uh, comes to stay with her sister who owns a needlework shop in Excelsior, and about a week after she arrives, the sister's murdered. Wow. And she's... She doesn't have any place else to go. She hasn't got any money. And there's a needlework shop there and, and to, that she's going to inherit anyway. And she says, well, it's got stock. It's got employees. How hard can it be? So she keeps the shop open and finds out that it's not as easy as it looks. As I was busy finding out because I thought needlework was easy. Had you done needlework? No, no. Well, I did a little bit of embroidery. My mother is a terrific needleworker. And so and she's like every other needleworker in the world. Oh, it's easy. If you can count to five, you can do hard anger. I can count to 100 and I can't do hard anger, let me tell you. That's, that, that's, it's not 
as easy as it looked. Well, nothing's as easy as no. it looks. You know, I mean, writing books isn't as easy as it looks. So you had you had to learn. Did you feel like so, as a writer, did you have to learn to do needlework or oh, write yeah. the books? You can't, you can't write what you know is the rule. Uh -huh. And so, yeah, absolutely. Um, uh, in the first book, Betsy is trying to learn to knit. She can knit, but she can't purl. <laughs> Couldn't purl to save my life. Uh, I finally had to get a friend to come on a, a Fourth of July picnic. I said, bring your knitting. <laughs> And I stood behind him, and I said, all right, Buster, purl. And he purled across the row, and I thought, oh, okay. And I don't know now what the problem was, but I understand it's not uncommon that people can't purl. You know, it's weird. It's, it, it's, it's, a, it's a fascinating thing, needlework. We don't think of it as fascinating because it's so homely. But there's some absolutely magnificent stuff being done out there. Oh, I bet. And I love the titles. Now, these are sold not only in bookstores, but they're also sold in needlecraft shops. Yeah, a lot of needle workshops are carrying them now. Oh, and, and are you the first fiction author to be carried in such shops? Oh, yeah. Oh, wow. yeah. Well, no. Uh, once in a while, you'll see early and followers uh, quilting mysteries in the shops that handle also hum uh, handle quilting materials. Mm -hmm. And in fact, it was seeing those that made my publisher decide that, well, my editor at, at Berkeley decide that she, someone should be writing these because she's a needleworker. Uh -huh. And so she, she sent me, uh, she asked me if I would do this. And I like, Betsy, how hard can it be? You know? <laughs> <laughs> but you fell in love. Yes. With it. And it was very wise to have a character who didn't know how to do it at the beginning. Well, you know, that was kind of, I meant for uh, Margot Bergman to be my sleuth. I started out with her, uh, but she owned a successful needlework shop and she knew everything about needlework. Well, again, right, but you know, and it's not just needlework, it's owning your own business. You know, as you're discovering, because you're mm -hmm. getting into the publishing business yourself, mm -hmm. there's a lot more to it than it looks like, and it's a complicated thing. It is. I took a course at the community college on, on the small business ownership, and I was like, oh my God, I don't begin to know enough. So I murdered Margot, <laughs> and I brought in her ignorant sister. So as I learned things, Betsy learns things. So everything in a book that happens, you really, re you really research. I've you go out and take classes on how to own a business yes. if you're writing about a business That's owner. Right. And there's one, uh, this one is about the antique car run from New London to New Brighton. A murderous yarn. And it's, uh, I got to go ride in a Stanley steamer and watch them start one up and ride in a lot of these old cars. That is, that is wonderful. That is is so fascinating these these ancient cars that go ticky 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 down the road they're still running some of these cars are starting their second century so it's your love of running. history and research that i would rather research than write really well how about you you write i write and i love the research part of it i do but i've never written anything historical uh, have so, you ever thought about it yeah i have i have thought about it but boy there's so many you know there's, there's so lots many options. Of options that's right so many that's options right. out there and another problem too is you start doing the research and next thing you know you're off on camping trips or you're off <laughs> riding in these old cars and you don't get any work done because you're so busy learning about the stuff it can become a thing in itself and i'm dyslexic so it'd be like the war oh. of 1218. <laughs> so, you know, I think there was a war. <laughs> Probably. There was always a war. There always a war back in those days. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. No, I, I admire people that write, that can write as well as you do and do all the well, research you. and still make it lively and fun. And they're very fun books. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. These, these are what are called cozies or traditional mysteries. The, it's an amateur sleuth. Betsy Devonshire is, has no training as a private eye or a police officer or anything like that. Um, the uh it's just that all of a sudden for no reason at all everywhere she goes she finds a body that's like a, a lunch at a lutheran church basement <laughs> <laughs> same thing all those hot dishes yeah <laughs> killing people left and right <laughs> there's a, a a fairly famous uh uh person in the needlework world her name is susan greening davis and she goes to needlework shops and she turns up at conventions and she gives talks on improving your business she gives them to shop owners you know how to improve your business and she said the biggest element of fantasy in my books is not that Betsy falls over a body everywhere she goes, but that she has time to sleuth. Ah. Because when you own your own business, it's like a 12-hour day every day. Oh, it it's, is. It's unbelievable. I'm a, I have this publishing house now that's publishing other authors, and it is 24-7. Yeah, I can't all believe the time. it. It's just, just, I'd love to go to get a real job to get away from my work sometimes. Just. <laughs> Let me read it. I love your titles for for this series. You have Cruel World, and that's C-R-E-W-E-L, uh -huh. Framed in Lace, A Stitch in Time, Unraveled Sleeve, A Murderous Yarn, Hanging by a Thread, and Cut Work. 
Cutwork will be the new one. That's the new one. That is coming out January 6th is the pub date of it. And it's uh, um, it's set at the art fair out there. Oh, I got a lot off my chest of modern <laughs> art. <laughs> It was really, really fun. Well, we recognize any of the artists. Did you do anything with any Minnesota artists in it, or no? Because most of them are suspects in the murder, so you know I, I couldn't do too many of them. Um, I uh, I talk about though the world of art. I mean, there's different levels. There's craft fairs, then there's art and craft fairs, then there's art fairs, then there's juried art fairs, and then there are the big, important art gallery presentation kinds of things. Then there's the museum end of stuff. And each one, each person is very jealous of his place, is always trying to move up a class. It's There's a lot of fighting that goes on. Oh, really? It's, it's, it's really kind of amazing. Is there a lot of stealing of ideas also? Because you have that in other art forms where people are afraid their script is being stolen or their line is being stolen. Well, that is the biggest sin, is stealing somebody else's idea. For um, You can do derivative, uh -huh. and critics love derivative because then they get to, to write about how derivative this thing is of somebody else's art form or it's the next step in a certain art progression. But to take an idea whole and mm -hmm. move it is a huge no-no. I would have no worry about stealing it. I have no skill, no skill at all with my hands. I go to sew really? what if we need a button sewn on. <laughs> I do. I have. I tried. No, I tried to safety pin them. It doesn't work. I have no skill. I tried cruel work. I tried um, the the stamp kind where it's even more yeah. cross stitch. Where they get, they have the photo there for you to follow, and you put little X's. And I ended up like with this massive lump at the back. Actually, the back was more interesting <laughs> than the front. I, I just don't know There why. are purists who absolutely hate it. You can't do a knot to start something. You have to run it under things, and you have to just work in certain areas. And it's just, there's there's people who talk about, the, you know, the, the backs have to look as good as the front, and they get into all this other stuff. But there are also people who say, well, if you put the sharp end of the needle through first, <laughs> you're doing it right. So as a writer, you're always learning. Always. And I've, Oh, and I had no idea when I got into this how huge this world was and how diverse. The the two big differences right now are counted cross stitch and needlepoint. And needlepoint is you take a canvas and you paint a picture on it, uh, and then you stitch over it, which okay. I think is stupid because you'll pay hundreds of dollars for these canvases, and then stitch over this painting that you paid so much money for. So it's kind of strange that way. And counted cross stitch is exactly what you were talking about. Here's the pattern over here, and it's and it's got all these little symbols on it. And you put an X over here on the cloth. No, mine was so even the easier kind. The, the, the pattern was stamped, stamped on, the on it, and I couldn't do and it. You couldn't do. <laughs> no, I can't even do those little things. You know those little pot holders they make where you put the loop at the ends. Uh huh. And you weave. You can't. You can't, do. You can't do. No, no. You skill. are. I this am. Is, I am dyslexic. Dyslexic. I can't tie my shoes. I didn't know you could be dyslexic in your hands. Too. I'm just miss learning disability. I just am from one one. And yet the you other. are a book publisher and a I, published I'm author. I'm a publisher. Yes, I do all. But do we? Do I do it well? <laughs> But well, I do. Yes, yes I do. do. I've been really yes, lucky. Do. I work very hard, and, and thank, and thank God for word processors. It's really helped. Oh, me more huge! Than, yeah, huge. It's made a big difference in the whole publishing world because it makes it a lot easier. And speaking of the publishing world, I find it interesting. Interesting that Murder at War. Why don't you? Hold, I love that cover so much. Hold it up again, because I think it's one of the best covers I've ever seen. And it's computer generated. It. Yeah, I know. I heard it was it's digital just, art. Yes, it's, well, it's amazing. Wonderful. But that original. Now this. What I find interesting is that this publisher. F FTL. FTL publications normally does science fiction books, but they love your book. Well, and does this kind of fit into the science fiction realm it, at all? It or? rhyme. It, it rings uh, fantasy chimes. Oh, all right. Because it's about people with modern attitudes who run around in medieval clothes, you know, uh, and, uh, and and anachronisms, despite the name, uh, keep turning up in the at the site all the time. You know, somebody come around, they have a, a beautiful goblet, jeweled and everything, but inside it is coke. Oh, you know, so. <laughs> And, and we like refrigeration and modern medicine too, <laughs> you know, at the at the different sites that we have these events at. So FTL so, Publications also does fantasy, science fiction, and fantasy, and and, and this rings and, and this one thing. Although actually, she's asked me. There's another book in the series that was never published, oh. and she's asked me to work on that, uh, and they may bring it up. And that has no elements of, of this in it at all. Are you willing to share the name with that one? or It's called Good Intentions. Do you always share, that's a great time, do you always share your names or? I remember when Tom Clancy was here and he was being interviewed, remember when he was going to buy the twins 
And, oh yeah, uh, I remember that. And one of the newsmen asked him in the audience, he said, well, what's your next book about? His answer was twenty nine ninety five. dollars 95 a great answer. Wouldn't say, no, but I think you have to give some kind of indication, okay. otherwise people won't buy it. If well, you've already interested. written it, you said just, you're just working on rewriting it and... Well, well, well cut work is done, uh -huh. and, and, I've, uh, and I'm working on one after that. Which for is the called, same series? For, for, the, for the Betsy series called uh -huh. Cruel Yule, and it's set at the Nashville market. Oh, and at Christmas time? At Christmas time. Okay. Yeah, it's, it's a... It, I love that title. What a great, that could be a country song, actually, if you think well, about actually, it. Yeah, I could, couldn't it? Yeah, you might want to throw... Cool you, yes. Yeah. Okay, I threw my baby over the ninth floor railing. There you go. <laughs> That's how it... <laughs> yeah, so, she, this one, she'd have to be going home in a coffin at the back of the train, and you're up in front with the dog, Yeah, and sad. Yeah, it's right. Yeah. Yeah, yeah and you, blue. you lost your knitting needles and your pickup <laughs> 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 Not a lot of fun with that book. <laughs> yeah, that would be kind of fun, wouldn't it? Yeah. Now, but you also have written other medieval mystery novels, haven't you? Yes, I wrote a series of novels with a friend, Margaret Fraser, uh, Gail Fraser. Excuse me, we were Margaret Fraser together. I was Margaret, she was Fraser. <laughs> I feel like I'm in the remake of Sybil. <laughs> so, oh, yeah. so Let me names. think, I'll channel this new person. <laughs> uh, Margaret Fraser uh, is a pseudonym of two people. We used to do book signings together, and I'd sign Margaret, and she'd sign Fraser, and our handwriting was totally different. So we said, see, schizophrenia here. <laughs> and that is set in England in the uh, early uh, 1400s, early 15th century, late medieval England. And it was set at the Priory of St. Frideswide. Uh, she's the patron saint of Oxford. And uh, uh, the, the protagonist is a nun named Fravis, Dame Fravis. And that was... Those were fun to do because both of us, she, she had been in the Society for Creative Anachronism too. And so we took a lot of our medieval research. For example, we had a funeral feast in one of them. Well, we'd been to feasts. And so we knew the kind of food that was served and we knew what it tasted like even. And since we'd worn the costumes of that period, we knew how to walk in them and what they felt like and so on. Learn by doing is, is very exciting and it lends an authenticity. Uh, I used to write it, the Peter Brichter series, the uh, wife in that thing rode, uh, bred Arabian horses. And I used to, I took lessons in horseback riding and I used to go to horse shows. So, because it, it, you can do research in books all you want, but sooner or later you've got to go do the thing. You know, just like I have, had to learn how to knit and I can now do counted cross stitch after a <laughs> I usually do a pattern just long enough to find out where the big problem in it is. Then it goes in a drawer and I can write See, about I the problem that he's having doing that pattern. I should try to do a mystery series about a woman who cleans her house. Because that would be good for me. I'd have to research on a, how to yeah, clean my house. Yeah. And, and that would be really that would be, Yeah, about, about the merry maids. Oh, there you go. Because then you go in all different houses all the time. Now, you, ha you have well, so many good books. Idea. Oh, thanks. Well, thank you. <laughs> We both will be coming. We'll be writing under no co-writing though. Because Pat Pulver. No. Oh no 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 no. no, no. Because we'll it, it, when when Gail and I we did six of those books together, those medieval books together, um, and we uh, we either had to break up the relationship or kill one another. I could never. It's I cannot very, imagine. And some hard. people can do it, but very few people can yeah, do it. Yeah, there are some who do it, and they do it beautifully, and they do it for a long time. But uh, the uh, woman who uh, edited the books that we did together said that she had um, edited a number of collaborations, one novel each. I have enough trouble dealing with my own multiple personalities. <laughs> I don't need another one. Another symbol here. Now, you have so many books out. How can people find out about them? Well, do you have a website? I have a website, monica-ferris.com. And I have covers there and sample chapters even. If and, do that. and then I think your publisher has a website too. Berkeley Publish Humble. And Berkeley I'm Publishing. Who, who, now, there used to be three publishers. One was Putnam, mm -hmm. one was Penguin, and one was Berkeley. And now they're all three together, and it's Penguin, Putnam, with Berkeley as a division. And uh, FTL Publisher uh, Publications has a, has, a website. has a website. Has a website. And people can always do a Google search. Of Mary Monica Pulver or Monica Ferris, either one, and it'll turn up. Everything will turn up? Yes, yes. I have pictures of me and other hats. Oh, do you? I love Now, do you always wear a hat? I try always when I'm, uh, when I'm doing an appearance, uh, when I'm... Uh, doing something like this, an interview, and uh, when I go to church on Sunday, <laughs> I have a purple outfit. I mean, purple. It's not lavender. It's not mobile. It's purple. And a huge purple head ended in marabou feathers. And somebody came up to me one time. I don't know if she was joking or if she was serious. She said, are you the bishop? <laughs> oh, wow. Because <laughs> it was purple. 
Yes, I love wearing hats. It's a it's a signature. It's a, and is it a security blanket in a way too? Because it makes you feel like, oh, I'm me. I'm I'm wearing. Well, actually, this. I'm, I'm not me. When I'm wearing this, I'm Monica Fair. Oh, okay. When I'm home, then 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 I run around in jammies all day or or jeans and stuff. But when I put this on, then I become Monica Fair. So it's your signature and it's your costume. In it's a, way. a costume. It's like a persona that I can put on. I always think of you in your hats, and I'm sure so many of your fans do also. Mm -hmm. and I love them. I love hats. Do people give you hats as presents? Yes. Yes. Uh, and I, there's a there's a little shop in Muncie, Indiana, where there's a there's a mystery convention there called Magna Cum Murder every October. And there's a little shop just a few blocks from the hotel, so I, I get a new hat there every year. And this is they're just they're just amazing. I mean, this is just like middle of the road. You should see some of the stuff she. Has. <laughs> it took, takes a certain amount of nerve when you put it on to go out in it, but then I put it on and I become Monica Ferris. Well, I could see if you were at Cub Foods, somebody. Oh no, no! Just... <laughs> <laughs> Are you the bishop? <laughs> I'm going to bless the foods. <laughs> How many hats do you think you have? I don't know. Probably somewhere between thirty and forty. It's a lot of hats. Yes, I've got some really old ones, antique hats. Uh, they're just they're wonderful and and each one is different I have sometimes I have a party at my house and people will start trying on the hats even the guys we all end up in the bathroom trying on hats <laughs> because they're because it, again it's like putting on a personality I had a, I gave a part a publication party once uh, for one of my books and uh, I asked people to wear hats did just, they and every, I had heard that some people were complaining why do I have to wear a hat I don't want to wear but later I heard they also what a wonderful idea for an icebreaker because you could go over and say, where did you get where your hat? Where did you get that hat? Yeah. And yet they used to be so commonplace. I really wish people yeah, would wear hats. I wish, they would, yeah. I wish they'd bring them back. Uh, it, people are kind of afraid of them. And also, if you've got your hair done real nice, you don't like to, to put on, because they really do mash your hair down. Yeah. But they're, but they're fun. They're fun. And the, the, the thing is, somebody can go into a bookstore and say, there's this author. I don't know her name, but she wears these hats. <laughs> and what is your biggest joy about writing? What is, what do you, where do you find your joy in writing? You said in research. Uh, is it also when you meet your readers? How, how is that for you? Oh, is I love meeting love readers. Uh, I had, uh, they take my characters seriously. I had somebody come up to me one time and, and say very earnestly, please don't let Betsy get mixed up with Joe Mickles. Ah. You know, like, like she was really concerned about her. And that's, it's a little bit scary, but it's very touching when they take them real. But I think the most satisfying is when you're working and the flow starts and the story just flows. You and the muse are having this wonderful conversation. And sometimes it gets moving along and it's like, I didn't know that. So I don't know where some of the parts of the story come from. And you're in your own sort of zone, aren't yeah, you? Yeah, just, yeah, zone and, and flow and all those kinds of words because you are. I mean, sometimes it, it goes for hours and, and, and the time just flies and then it, it's, it's exciting. It's wonderful. Well, the whole thing's exciting. Well, you know, you Why know. Right? Get in the idea. It works when you write it. You sell it. Don't let anybody fool you. Imitation is not the sincerest form of flattery. Money is. <laughs> <laughs> when somebody you don't know offers you money for something you've written, that's flattery. And then to get the advanced copy of the thing, and there it is with your name and everything. It's all exciting. Oh, my God. My God. Now, one thing, do you find this exciting? Because one of my favorite books in the world is Rewrites by yeah. Neil Simon, a brilliant book on the art of writing. How, do you, how much do you rewrite? Do you rewrite oh, I, all, the, all the time? That's why the computer is a huge blessing to me. Because I, oh, back when I was writing on a typewriter, I would literally cut the, paper, the story into pieces, you know, and paste it or tape it down on, on other sheets of paper, trying to move it around to find the best place for it. So the computer enables you to do that instantaneously. I love, I love rewriting. I think rewriting is probably one of the. I was gonna say it's one of my favorite parts, but it's all favorite. It's, yeah, but I it do. is. How much do you like rewriting? I love rewriting. I don't feel you can write unless you rewrite. I write. I'm a crummy writer, but I'm a pretty good rewriter, and that's what I go to because yes. I rewrite yes. and I rewrite yes. and I rewrite. So. Are you in a writers group? I am in a writers group, and that's very important. I think it always is. Extremely important. Do you meet yeah. every week with your writers? Yeah, ours, group? ours meets every week, and it's uh, amazing what they can pick up and what they can see, and how they strengthen the writing. You know, uh, your character is not into this scene deeply enough. Criticism like that, writing criticism, as opposed to like fan criticism. How many people are in your group? Uh, well, there's about twelve, but usually only eight or nine will come to any given meeting. And do you? Do you get your manuscript to them beforehand, or do you just read it out we, loud? We there? bring it in. I bring a copy for everybody in the room, and then then I read it, and they follow along, and then they scribble all over it and make cutting remarks. And 
Oh, I know, doesn't it just... And sometimes I, it hurts. I, <laughs> sometimes it's so hard, it's so painful. I know, I can do 800 men uh, going to war and they wanted a stripper I can entertain in front of them. But <laughs> doing a writer's workshop can That's be so great. scary. Standing yes. up reading your writing is a lot more scary than doing that, you know. That's because when you're writing, there's nothing between you and them. You can't say they didn't like the color of the paper right. or they didn't like the color of the ink. It's you... They, they say writing is, is sitting down on a typewriter and now a computer and opening a vein because you are on that page. And if they don't like it, it's like they don't like you. And that can be very painful. And as you know, I do stand-up comedy. And what was interesting to me about writing was that here I'm doing stand-up in front of people. I mean, two feet from them sometimes, just going at them, whatever, yeah. having fun. Writing is so much more intimate. Isn't that amazing? Isn't it? They take because it's it only you. Room. you, you and the, and, you the, and, the, and the machine that you're writing on, and yet it's more intimate. Yeah. You're right. There's there's a there's a closeness and openness there that, that, that isn't in even you, public appearance. You realize they're sitting in their bedroom, in their bed, reading you, or they're taking you around the house, reading you, or they're going to something major in their life, and they're reading your book on the way as an on the train. Sometimes they read it as an escape too, and that's why I like the cozies like this because they're comfort reads. They are in these books justice happens and that can be very important if you're going through a time in your mm -hmm. life when you don't see that and it's important right now i think i love cozies i find them yeah i love also i like hard-boiled i like a mainstream literature mm -hmm. i like any sort of writing um but cozies can comfort me and they can yeah sometimes i just need to relax a place to go yeah. for a while where it's safe and it's all right sort of like a spa for the brain huh so we just you have a real talent for that. That is Thank good. You. A spa for the, the brain. brain. I'm going to use that. You're welcome. <laughs> we steal things. Right? I'll wear a hat. I'm going to wear a hat. I have such a big hat, I can't even get hats. I do. I'm one of those people with a... But I love hats. Oh, come to my house. I have a couple of hats I can't wear because they're too this big. Will, oh, I've got... This is... Mad. Besides just my own personality, big hat, I do. I have this this head that's... Uh, but I love come, I would come do with it. Come Muncie one of these years. I'll take you over to I Maddie plan Coleman to. and we'll try on hats. I, oh, I would love to. I plan to go to that convention. I haven't gotten to it. Are uh, you going to May Mayhem in the Midlands? Is no, a great convention. No. They'll be next spring in Omaha for people to go to. Well, there's all sorts of wonderful, wonderful writing events in Minneapolis. But there's wonderful Thank writers. And you are you are one of them. And Thank one you. of Minnesota's gifts well, to so the are world. You. Well, so are you. I love no, your no, work. you are with your work. And so we have Murder at the War. And we have your wonderful Betsy Devonshire series. And thank you so much, Mary Monica Pulver, also known as Ma Monica <laughs> Paris <laughs> and Margaret Fraser. Yes. And, and a few other names that she once used in Iowa that we, was just a weekend thing. <laughs> <That's> so, <laughs> thank you so much. Thank you very much. And tvbookshelf.com. There you go. Find out more. There you go. There you go. Thank you.